Well, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Sarah Lucan. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an associate director of admissions and recruitment for the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this virtual info session where we'll be talking about using your degree from the, the, the Brown School. Uh, I first, before we jump in, I would like to introduce my co-host of the session, Clarissa. Clarissa, if you want to come off mute and introduce yourself to everyone. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you all and see you all. My name is Clarissa Jackson, and I am a admissions and recruitment specialist here at the Brown School. I'm also a Brown School alum in this W 2016, so this is a really special webinar that we're putting on today. Them. Thanks so much, Clarissa. And before we introduce our wonderful, wonderful panel that I am really excited about today, I'm going to go through just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, and so if for any reason you can't stay for the entire time, uh, you can come back and watch the recording later, which will be posted on our YouTube channel. Closed captions are enabled and can be activated at any time. And in a Zoom webinar, uh, we can't see or hear the audience and we can't call on raised hands. Uh, what we would encourage you to do is to use the Q&A feature, not the chat, to submit questions. You can continue to use the chat to introduce yourself, which I'm seeing folks coming in from Uganda, Zimbabwe. We've got, uh, let's see, Ghana. Uh, a lot of friends from African countries. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really glad that you're here. Uh, some of the questions will be answered uh, within the Q&A window by admissions staff, and some will be selected to be answered by the live panel. So I uh, just know that we will try to get to them. If we don't have a chance to answer your question, you can send it to us at brownadmissions at wustel.edu. And a reminder, today's topic is about using your degree from the Brown School. So uh, if you can keep your questions on topic and more general, that would be wonderful. If you have a specific question, question about your you know, application or anything along those lines, you can reach out to us directly. And without further ado, I am going to ask my panel to introduce themselves. I, like I said, we have a really incredible panel of alumni today uh, who I am so grateful that they decided to spend some of their time with us today uh, chatting about their experience. And so we'll just start with at the top with Megan. And if you want to go We'll go across and just uh, introduce yourself in order that you see yourself on the screen. Uh, that would be great. Megan, we'll start with you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Really glad to be here uh, this afternoon on my time. I am uh, from Chicago. Uh, I am the Director of Development at the University of Chicago's uh, Network for College Success. So that's a project that works with high school educators um, as well as district leaders. Um, I have been there for quite some time, and I graduated from the Brown School in 2010 with an MSW. So nice to be here. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Barabas. Um, I graduated in 2017 with my master's in public health from the Brown School. Um, I am currently an associate director. I work in consulting, um, specifically focused around state healthcare. Um, so I work with a variety of states on, um, on finance and policy and, and really excited um, for you all to be looking into your uh, future academic experiences and happy to be here. Hi, you guys. My name is Deja Miles. I graduated from the Brown School and Olin Business School in 2021 with my MBA in MPH. I currently serve as a manager for our market access payer marketing arm um, here at AbV. Um, I support Skyrizan and Vogue, which are some of our larger immunology products. And yeah, super happy to be here today. Hi, everyone. My name is Koshanate, I'm originally from Ghana. I see a number of Ghana folks and Uganda folks joining and Zimbabweans. So I graduated with an MSW and an MSP, that's the Masters of Social Policy, a dual degree um, in 2022. I'm currently a research associate with International Child Health and Adolescent, International Child and Child Health and Development, sorry. And I'm also a PhD student here at the Brown School. Happy to have you all here. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Ashwarya, and I use she, her pronouns. I graduated from the Brown School with a Master's of Public Health uh, in 2019, and I had a global health specialization. Right now, I live in Baltimore. I'm originally from New Delhi, India, um, and I work as a senior analyst at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, which is a center at Johns Hopkins that basically looks at um, policies and programs that you can implement to minimize the danger and impact of acute public health events that endanger people's health all over. So excited to be. Um, and my name is Molly, um, and I am currently actually a pr assistant professor of practice at the Brown School. Um, but I graduated with my MSW from the Brown School in 2019. And so um, I've had some really formative experiences immediately after I graduated, graduated that led me to teaching. Um, so I can talk a little bit about the Brown School and what it's like to teach there, but also um, where my career has gone otherwise. So happy to be here too. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Well, uh, as you will learn uh, in hearing from our incredible panel today, our graduates are really doing some amazing work in the field, uh, leading, you know, leading the charge in social work, public health, and policy, uh, and doing some really incredible things. Our graduates go on to really high level positions pretty shortly after they graduate. And so you'll see reflected on the screen titles uh, like program and center directors. We have certainly therapists and counselors, senior managers, research analysts, doctoral students, faculty members, uh, fundraising and finance specialists, social entrepreneurs, policy analysts, government officials, uh, so and so, so, so much more. Um, and so I'm excited that we have uh, a few folks here that represent some of these really cool titles uh, to share about what they've been doing since they've graduated from the Brown School and specifically how the Brown School kind of helped prepare them for uh, the work that they're doing now. And so I'm gonna turn it to Clarissa to get us started with our first round of questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can just see each other uh, and we'll dive in. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so for our panelists, we got to little, hear a little bit more about you and your introduction of what you graduated with as your degree, but could you all share what your specializations and concentrations were when you studied at the Brown School? Sure. Happy to jump right in. I, my specializations were in epidemiology and biostatistics um, for my public health degree. And yeah. My, uh, my public health degree was in health policy analysis. Um, I can jump in. So my social work concentration was violence and injury prevention, and my specialization was sexual health and education. Um, caveat, though, the violence and injury prevention concentration is now a specialization. But I just want to give a quick plug you can individualize at the Brown School. So even though it's not offered as an official concentration, you can still um, kind of create your own concentration if you want to. Uh, yeah, so I was looking at social and economic development and I, I did do specialization. I was really looking at community programming. So that was a big focus for me. So mine was an international social and economic development. That was my MSW concentration. And my specialization was in management. And I'll round off my MPH specialization was in global health. Great, thank you all so much. And Molly, I'm with you. I was individualized as well. So definitely take a look at that for anyone who's interested. And Deja and Portia, specifically to you both, I know that you both have received dual degrees. Um, can you share more about what that process was like and how did your, um, or sorry, can you share why you pursued both degrees and how did the two degrees inform the work that you do currently? Yeah, happy to jump in again. So um, I started my master's in public health degree first. I, I had a new, unique experience. I came from the business world and then 
I pivoted to healthcare to join BJC and of capacity and marketing. And so when I came to Brown School, I was specifically looking to focus on epidemiology and biostatistics. There were, um, we know there's a disparity uh, among women of color, um, maternal mortality, in terms of maternal mortality, excuse me. And so that is what I was legitimately interested in. I wanted to study that, the mechanics of that. And so um, that's why I tacked on that epibio concentration. When I joined um, and I started actually going through the process, I realized quickly that if I really wanted to um, impact change, I would likely need a business degree. Um, the sought goal was to be a healthcare administrator in some form. And so the business degree is really helpful to really understand the landscape in its entirety, understand how hospitals are funded and just the different channels. Um, and so that was important for me to understand that from both like a business landscape, a federal landscape, a policy landscape, and then um, at an epidemiological landscape. So um, it, it was kind of necessary for me to have both for the change that I wanted to uh, make. So. Yes, yeah, so um, like data, I also started on my MSW first, and then I decided to add on the MSP because I'm interested in translating research into policy. So I really wanted to understand how to do that, like evidence-based policy, um, backing policies with research work, research findings. So I decided to add on um, the social policy degree, which I was happy I did. So I was supposed to graduate in 2021, but because I added on the MSP, I graduated in 2022. And how I'm using that in my current work or role, as I said earlier, I'm a research associate I'm with one of the biggest research centers at the Brown School, which does a lot of research in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Uganda, Ghana, um, South Africa, Zimbabwe. So I have been drafting all the policy, like most of the policy briefs that goes out from my research center and how the findings that we get from our research um, is proposing policies to policymakers in this country. So it has been really been helpful um, for me to add on that degree where I have like the two hats of both a social worker and also um, a social policy um, analyst or someone who is an, um, interested in social policy. So that's how come I ended up doing a dual degree and this is how I'm using it in my current talk. I do apologize, Clarissa. I didn't say how I used it in my current work. So right now I work in payer marketing and the biggest part of my job is working with payers. Payers for us are going to be all of your insurance companies. So in America, we have a bunch of different insurance companies. You have commercial, you have Medicaid, Medicare. They're all different. What I do is in my current role is we create marketing materials and we market to those payers. We have contract negotiations. We make sure that the products are on formulary so that when a patient goes to a doctor's office, if they need to be prescribed the highest quality medications like we offer um, at my organization, that we are able to, the patient is able to actually receive the medication. So I do use a ton of epidemiology because we're looking at the prevalence and the incidents when we're looking at like then from a biostatistics arm we do use a ton of um stats so everything is statistical so that's super helpful great thank you so much and uh this is a bit of a fluid interview so just to kind of lean into some of the career questions that we had too uh deja meg and elizabeth um can you share for yourself we did your goals that you came into the Brown School stay the same as you went into your current role? Um, or did your goals change depending on the classes you took or just kind of the real world, world experience that you were having? So I, um, before I went into the Brown School, I was working for a mentoring program and I saw how important that was, but I didn't, what I wanted when I went into the Brown School was to say, it's one thing to work with students for a couple of hours a week. It's not enough. Like, what is the bigger system at play here? What are the, how can we create greater social impact to serve more young people, to serve better serve communities? So that's what I went to school to learn more about. Like, not just a couple hours of impact. How can you really make like a systemic difference? Um, 
of course, I think during my time there, like I learned, right? Like it wasn't a straight shot to learning that. It was kind of like, what am I collecting over time? And I would say like, in addition to the content, so the really great courses, right? The really great professors, the things I learned were um, not just how to advocate for others, but how to advocate for myself, right? Um, how to think really critically and write better. Um, and my job now actually has a lot of writing. So I found something where I can learn I learned like how to make some change and then I learned what does it look like for me to do it specifically right so what does it look like at a, at a big system level and how could I impact the system um I think I understood what I wanted to go to school for but I didn't have the words for it I didn't really know I wanted more but I didn't I couldn't articulate it and I couldn't figure out what to do about it which is why I went to the brown school I feel like when I left the brown school I did have a much better sense of that right so right after the brown school I went to work for a community development corporation and that really helped me understand what does it look like to impact a community at multiple levels um from that, I transitioned to working, um, I'm not the University of Chicago, I work for their social work school, but again, for a specific project that's working in education. So over time, I found that one of the ways to make the biggest impact was in the school building at, at in education systems. So I took what I learned, that kind of ecosystem piece, and I then again, what am I really good at? Where do I fit in that? And um, I'm really good at writing. I'm really good at talking with people. So I went into development, fundraising, right? That's where I felt like I could have a really big impact on the system. Um, I can go next. So I feel like originally um, going into the Brown School, I uh, sort of similar to what Megan was saying, like I knew that I had certain passions, but um, I really needed like the opportunity to refine what those were. Um, and especially for me, I feel like I discovered public health a little bit later um, in my like academic career. Um, and so going to the Brown School for me was a way to really help identify like what within public health I was interested in and where like um, I didn't necessarily have a specific like this is for sure what I want to do afterward. And so uh, that was like something that I think the Brown School really helped me with, especially in terms of health policy. I was just really intrigued by the idea um, that changing a small policy can make a really big difference um, in outcomes, um, even, you know, subconsciously for a lot of people. And so ultimately, that's what led me into consulting. And I know, um, we mentioned Medicaid earlier, so that's a lot of what I do. Um, and specifically, like trying to help states implement policies that um, will really benefit their people the most, especially like within the limited financial resources that they often have. Um, and so I think the Brown School really helped me to, um, to identify that that's what I was interested in, especially um, with so many really wonderful classes in health policy. Yeah, I think for me, it changed um, throughout the process. I was always super interested in marketing. I came in with a marketing and sales background, um, but Brown School kind of shaped me in that. And, and so did my degree from Olin because I was exposed to um, the evaluation center. I worked there for two years. And so um, that is baby consulting, if you will. And so I worked, that was amazing work that I did. Um, then I was exposed to Olin. And so I think it shifted. Like I knew I wanted to stay in marketing. Um, and maybe the impact that I wanted to make needed to be broader. And so for me, it wasn't necessarily on the subset of maternal mortality anymore, but it's like impacting millions of different lives on a huge scale, like what's best for an individual patient, but looking at it um, from that, like a very high level overview. And so for me, I, I, I love what I do. Um, and I'm very grateful, so. Thank you so much, Deja. Um, do we wanna pivot to the question in the chat, Sarah? Um, that was posed to Deja, because Deja, I know you have to go soon, so I wanna respect your time. Uh, if you have time for one more question. Um, 
So Maxwell asks, how different is the practice from that in sub-Saharan Africa as most SSA market access activities currently focus on making otherwise expensive medication affordable and available to patients in very deprived populations? Kindly provide some more insight. So first, I did not say this at the very beginning. I want to say that um, my individual opinions are my own and not that of my organization. Um, so I do have to have that caveat. I work in a very uh, regulated industry. Um, so I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. I'm so looking with for it. Oh, <laughs> I can't yes. find it. So it's in our Q&A, but it says, uh, with regard to market access, how different is the practice from that in sub-Saharan Africa? as most SSA market access activities currently focus on making otherwise expensive medication affordable and available to patients in very deprived populations. So I'm very happy to announce like majority of the medications that we have, obviously, or some of them are like, uh, they went through various and very rigorous um, um, clinical trials. And so very high quality medications here in terms of making it affordable, if a patient cannot afford a medication, we have several policies in place where it's like a complete program. Um, and this could be a Medicaid patient. I know I supported before I joined the immunology franchise, I supported the neurology franchise. And that particular product um, that I supported, it went more from an access standpoint to patients that um, were more likely to be like Medicaid patients or that otherwise. And so it will vary for product to product and channel to channel. Um, I don't know at a global level, I support the U.S. market access payer landscape conversation offline. So. And yes, I do have to drop, I have a meeting, but I do appreciate you all. Um, feel free to share my email and my first and last name and um, with anyone who would like to connect with me offline and happy to answer questions. But thank you, Sarah and Clarissa, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Deja. Bye. So I think uh, Deja had on a lot of great points, especially as you all, panelists as well. I think kind of talking about how the Brown School has helped you shift as you go on your journey, but also giving you those opportunities to expand our thinking and expand how we um, are changing jobs in the world. So I think to uh, Portia and Ashwarya, I wanted to pose this question directly to you both. Uh, Ashwarya, I believe you've worked in admissions as a student ambassador while you were in uh, graduate school. And then Portia, you spoke about this earlier, your research associate professor with ICAD and the wonderful work you're doing. I was just wondering for our students who are thinking about practicum or thinking about, um, or not practicum, that's a different question, but thinking about opportunities outside of academics, like part-time work or assistantships, could you speak to maybe how the process was for you um, to get those uh, roles that you've had while you were here, but then also how these opportunities may have opened doors for you in your career? Yeah, I could go first. So I'm a research associate and a PhD student, um, research associate with iChat. So I had my um, foundation practical with iChat. And the process to that, I would say um, for my international um, potential students here, the Brown School is very supportive, very supportive. Like there are so many people, I mean, so many offices here to make sure you have a good experience. They are here to support you, even tailoring your CV. There's a whole office, I mean, career services is here to help you do that. So I went to office, office of Field Education, which is responsible for um, practicum. And then they recommended iChat where I am currently to me. And then I had my foundation practicum here. Still through OFE, Office of Field Education, I got my concentration practicum with um, the International Institute. They work with um, refugees. So I would say if you're an international student and you were here, just ask. Um, where do I go to get what? And then they are there to, to guide you, to give you a best fit experience. I was interested in research. I was interested in doing work in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then that's how come they recommended iChat to me. And I've been at iChat for like getting to five years. And I, I worked in full-time as a study coordinator after my 
a master's, and then now I'm in the PhD and still working with iChat as a research associate. So I would say that the Brown School is very supportive and would help you. There are tons of organizations um, in St. Louis that if you want to do something off campus, you've, you'd always find so many organizations. You just have to reach out to them. If you want to do research, there are so many research centers at the Brown School doing different things. You can also reach out. There are professors who have research portfolio, you can also look at them. And aside that, um, which is like your course requirement, like um, practical and professional development, if you really want to earn, I mean, just work as, in assistantship to earn money, which is not tailored to your professional development. There are also so many on-campus student employment. Um, and as international students, we are only um, allowed to work on campus. There are so many places. At the Brown School, um, if you want to go to the med school, but I, I, I've not seen any Brown School students go there because there are so many opportunities here, even in residential life. That is the undergraduate um, housing section of WashU. They also have a lot of openings. Um, so you just have to um, look and you would get. And just finally, the Brown School also holds um, a part-time job fair. If I'm saying that correctly, Sarah, please correct me, where these organizations come in to the Brown School, they have a table, you go to them and then they can even recruit you on the spot. So, thank you. And I'll co-sign everything that Portia said, especially the part about the Brown School creating so many opportunities for you to learn about different sorts of employment that you can reach, uh, that you can opt for on campus. Um, I think I started my employment, part-time employment out of necessity. I needed to find a way to pay my rent. Um, but I think it morphed into something a bit more serious than that, where um, I started finding opportunities by asking. Like you said, Portia, I would ask my professors, hey, I'm really interested in the work that you're doing. I would like to do this kind of research professionally. Do you have any room to bring a student on? Um, and you're only allowed to work for 20 hours per week maximum as an international student. So you better believe I have like six jobs filling all of those 20 hours and I'm milking each of them. Some are for personal development and for uh, like admissions really tapped into my extroverted energy and my interest in connecting people to this really good experience. Um, but then I had a lot of other research associate jobs, um, in particular one where my professor, who's a professor of practice, um, got a project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I just so happened to ask her at the right time if she needed a student. And what then ensued was a two year incredible research opportunity that then morphed into a job that I had for three years after graduating from the uh, from the Brown School. So there's just so many opportunities. I think all of them are really valuable in their own way. Um, and asking is a really big piece of it. I know it's scary because asking for help is hard and I still struggle with it. Uh, but you ask enough and you ask the right people and there's always somebody who's looking to support students, help you grow professionally. And it's just nice to have like folks who are interested in the work that you're doing uh, to support them through uh, a paid employment opportunity, like I think the opportunities that you got, Portia, and the opportunities that I was lucky enough to avail. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I know that's an important question for folks, so we appreciate your insight. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to add anything to that in their own experiences with um, other involvement, or um, even if it was a practicum specifically that helped uh, to open some doors into your career path? Um, please feel free to share with folks. Yeah, I think one thing that I would add to what Ashwario was saying was um, it can be intimidating to ask and reach out to professors and um, people in the community about opportunities. But one thing that was helpful for me when I was a student is rather than thinking of like, oh, you are the professor, I am the student, which that is true. Um, a helpful reframe for me was, yes, you're a professor and I'm a student, but we are colleagues, right? We are all invested in one another's success um, and that we all want good things for one another. And I really feel that now that I am a professor at the Brown School. I am now literally a colleague with people who taught me in the classroom just a few years ago. And so... Um, I think that even if you don't end up teaching at the Brown School, you will end up often continuing to work with 
professors at the Brown School, even when you were out in the field. So I think that just helped me just psychologically to think like, yes, you know, I am deferring to you as the professor. And, you know, there is genuine investment in our success because we are also colleagues. And so when that kind of clicked for me, that helped me feel a lot less timid um, and helped me feel much more comfortable with networking. I think that's something that makes the Brown School particularly distinctive. Um, I have uh, I have some friends who've gone to other social work schools over the years, and they were kind of assigned where to go for their practicums, and they were kind of had a very narrow path for their first year, and then a very narrow path for their second concentration year. And I think that could be right for some people, right? Like that that could be the path, and you you just really want the direction. I think what makes the Brown School really unique is that there is a lot of opportunity. And yes, there's that intimidating piece, but then there's this like, I get to choose what I want to do. And then there's people here that will support me do it. And I need to go look for it. And I really appreciated that. Um, I, I specifically chose a school that wasn't as directive because, um, we, you know, we've all, we've all graduated from undergrad, right? Like now what are the choices we want to make about where we go? And I think the Brown school is particularly good at letting you do that. Um, with what, what, what my other peers have said, right. With, with your own advocacy, with asking the questions and with kind of going forth and, and kind of making the connections. Oh, and one more thing I would add, um, both of my social work practicums. So my foundation practicum and my concentration practicum ultimately led to two separate full-time jobs. Um, and at a lot of other schools, you don't get to choose your practicum. It is assigned to you. Um, but at the Brown School, you have to seek out practicum opportunities and apply. And then if you get different offers, you have choices to make. And I mean, I don't think if I had been assigned my practicum, I don't think it would have been such a pipeline to my career because I had agency that increased my investment and how seriously I was taking the experience. And my colleagues at my practicum site saw that and led to full-time employment after I graduated. So that was, that was a really, really important experience for me. And I know that um, it can feel frustrating sometimes doing a practicum for credit um, rather than paid wages. Um, some practicums are paid, um, but I just cannot emphasize enough like what an important opportunity practicum really is because that that's the start of your career. Your career is beginning in your practicum. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Molly. And I think that's such a wonderful transition into talking about what do we do after we get our degree in the Brown School? How does it jumpstart that career piece? So I'm going to give it to Sarah Lucan to finish asking some questions to you all. Thank you. Thanks, Clarissa. Yeah. So the next question we actually had, uh, speaking of first jobs right after and kind of how the Brown School um, got you there. Um, if a few of you could Tell us, what was that first position? Um, describe the type of work that you did. Uh, we'll start with Elizabeth on this one. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am actually still working in the same role, essentially more, or the same job, but different role um, as when I graduated. So I've been, I work in healthcare consulting. Um, like I mentioned, I work with states to help them figure out how to align their policy goals with within their limited financial opportunities. And so um, I started out at what was called like a senior consultant right out of the Brown School. Um, and I was just really intrigued by the opportunity to work with a variety of different states, which all kind of have their own program um, here in the U.S. Uh, because of our fragmented healthcare system, um, we do have, you know, each state runs their own program when it comes to Medicaid. Um, and one of the biggest things that I learned, or I think my knowledge was really refined here at the Brown School, was talking, I uh, was learning about how different people react differently to different messages, um, which I know is like sort of obvious when you say it, but 
you know, we spent a lot of time in my health policy classes talking about this, like the importance of tailoring messages differently to different people. So if I'm talking to state legislature, um, a state legislature, I would have to have really high level information. Usually they're very busy. They're not spending a lot of time focused on one topic. Whereas if I'm talking to a Medicaid beneficiary or participant, um, you know, that's going to be totally different. That those are these are sometimes people who don't really have a lot of healthcare literacy. Um, and, you know, we really want to tailor the message accordingly. And so that's something that has just really, really stuck with me um, since my time at the Brown School that I feel like I've been able to use in my job. And that's sort of one of the reasons that I think I've been able to grow my career at this um, at my same firm, Guidehouse, um, because I started, you know, with that knowledge in the background. Um, and so that, like I said, is one of the things that has really made me stick with it. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ashwarya, do you want to answer this question too? Yeah, sure. Um, I was really lucky that one of my uh, employment opportunities and research opportunities at the Brown School turned into a job right after. But again, this was one not one of those opportunities that was publicized at the Brown School. It's one that I got through networking with my professors and showing interest in their classes. I took quite a few classes that uh, some of the professors that I worked with later taught. Um, it was really interesting because I didn't think that you could do applied research as a job. I thought you just had to go get your PhD or pick industry, but I've somehow landed two jobs that do applied research and I'm just seeing how long I could go continuing on this professional journey. Um, though my job right after graduation specifically focused on integrating gender equality and social inclusion into different international development and global health programs. So I got to work on so many different topic areas, everything from child marriage, gender-based violence, menstrual health and hygiene. Um, and it really pulled on a lot of my skill sets of data analysis, targeted communication, health communication specifically, um, qualitative data analysis, and mixed methods data analysis in general. I became like a graphic designer on the side just because I was the only person who knew how to use Canva. Um, it was really interesting. It was a jack of all trades kind of a job and I loved it. I think it set me up really well to understand what kind of applied research skills I actually like and that I actually want to keep using. So that was a really great job. I had it for three years, which was the extent of um, the visa you can get once you leave the Brown School. Um, and then I'm lucky enough to have pivoted into another role that focuses less on the gender equality, social inclusion side of things and more on the preparing for the next pandemic, preventing bioterrorism type of topic area. But all of this, I highly recommend applied research as a career opportunity. It has every day I can pinpoint, yep, I'm pulling on what I learned from class A or class B or that weird skills lab I took because I didn't know what else to take. It, the chickens have come home to roost or whatever that phrase is. Like I have pulled on this little nugget of information that I got at like 7 p.m. on a Thursday evening. So I'm very grateful to what I learned, not only for the job I had right after graduating, but also now every day. I'm like, cool, that public health education really paid off. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And I, there was actually a comment in the chat, which I think you just spoke to beautifully, Ashwarya and, and Portia, you can chime in too, because I'm sure you've got some thoughts around this, uh, but a comment on, you know, research, they say research has limited opportunities, but I think Ashwarya, you just kind of demonstrated there are so many things you can do in research. Uh, Portia, do you want to share a little more about that too? Yeah. Uh, I just want to add on to what Ashwarya has said. So I think um, research is rather like gives you a broad, like gives you a big world for you to swim in and you can do almost anything that you like. And more importantly, you get to be able to work on what you are passionate about. So research is when you are able to like, um, maybe write grants, get the money to do the work that you want and not um, work on something that you are not interested in. So. I think as Ashraya has said, there are so many opportunities when you leave the Brown School, you can work as a study coordinator where you are the one like coordinating all the different pieces of the study, um, managing the study for the PI and being close communication. You can also do data analysis. And most of our MPH um, people, I always say like, that's why I admire MPH because they have a lot of statistical um, skills and knowledge once they come out of the program. So if you're interested in analyzing data, you get to work with a lot of data 
in these research institutions or research centers and you can explore. So right now I am being prepared so that in the future I become an independent researcher where I lead um, my own research, where I do the work that I want, um, recruit the participants. I've always been passionate about all my life. So I think research gives you like such a huge platform. You can explore, find a niche, see where you belong, test it out. If you don't want, you can shift. So yeah, I would always recommend um, research and particularly applied research as Ashraya has said, I am more interested in um, intervention research and that is what my research center does. We have so many interventions where you're able to see the real change, the real impact and you would measure it. So you give them the intervention, what you think is the problem, you find a solution backed by evidence and theory. You administer the solution and then you test it. You know, you collect the data, you measure to see if it's making um, an improvement in the lives of these people. So I would always recommend research. I didn't have an interest in research until the Brown School. I was just doing like nonprofit outreach work. I didn't even know it was research at that time. Just, I mean, reaching out to rural um, women in rural communities doing economic empowerment. I didn't know what I was doing was research. It was just something I loved. And then I got to the Brown School and I realized I got to know this is research, it's applied research, intervention research. And I was fortunate to find like a group of people that do what I'm interested in. So I would always recommend um, <laughs> applied research. Thank you. Can I add something else about research? Um, in addition to what Ashwara and Portia said, I think that one of the really cool things about research is that the skills are super transferable. Um, so like I, my job right now is not technically research, but I think that my role doing research when I was at the Brown School and I had, um, I did research at both the medical school and the Brown School um, at my, like during, during my time um, getting my master's. And I think that the skills of like being able to understand how to synthesize information, uh, translate it back in a really um, easily digestible way, um, being able to like write grant funding or like those types of things, those are really transferable and don't only apply to research. So I think that's one of the reasons that research is so common with students at the Brown School because um, even if you don't ultimately want to go into research as your job, I think um, it's a really great way to learn additional skills that, that you can take with you wherever you go. Thank you for adding that. Yeah, that's all super, so super great. Um, for those who may not be interested in research, though, I know there are a few who are maybe don't want to go down that path, and it does it does inform a lot of what we do, though, regardless of how applied uh, you're, how deep into the applied work you're doing. Uh, Molly, you landed in academia, and you're now teaching. Do you want to talk a little bit about your role now and kind of how? Uh, coming to the Brown School kind of wove you back to this place and, and the work that you're doing now? Sure. So um, I am not a researcher. Um, I am in academics, but I, I am an assistant professor of practice. I am not a researcher. Um, and I kind of had um, the inverse experience of what other folks on this call had. So I came to the Brown School thinking that I wanted to do research, um, but I quickly learned I don't. Um, and I think a big part of the reason um, for me specifically is my interests and my practice um, is really centering stigmatized communities. So people living with HIV, people who use drugs, um, sex workers, and um, folks of other marginalized sexual identities. And one tricky thing, um, because of because of stigma, because of social and political stigma, there's already a ton of evidence out there. Um, we we have the tools. We know what we need to do, but we don't have um, the social capital or the political will to do the things we know need to happen. So, for example, um, my first job, um, which my practicum led to my first job, was... Um, working in HIV advocacy um, here in Missouri, um, we had some of the most punitive HIV specific criminal laws in the country. Um, in Missouri, you could be charged with a felony 
for living with HIV and spitting on the ground in front of somebody, which that cannot transmit HIV. We know that, right? We don't need more research confirming that. We know that. Um, there's also a ton of data um, and research on that criminalizing HIV does not reduce rates of HIV transmission. We have that. What I became really interested in was advocacy and community organizing. So in my work, I'm not the one doing the research, but I take the research and I use it to empower communities to center themselves in the response and to get the policy win across the finish line. Um, so my work is, um, it's macro, but it's kind of meso, really. It's kind of, it's not like direct practice. I'm not providing clinical um, clinical work. I'm not a therapist. Um, I'm not the one doing the research, but I'm the one taking the research and working directly with people um, to empower them to, to make change. Um, so it's like, I think of researchers as the ones kind of being like, okay, here's what we know. Here's, here's what we know needs to happen. And I take it and I help make it happen. Um, and so, um, I worked for a while in HIV advocacy in Missouri. We had a major policy win. It was very, very exciting. Um, fewer people are now um, prosecuted for their HIV status. I also worked in LGBTQ policy, um, specifically um, aging policy and organizing LGBTQ older adults um, in working with the um, State Department of Aging Services to improve um, our area agency on aging um, response to LGBTQ older adults. Um, and then after that, I actually did exclusively freelance work um, for a while. I did freelance consulting and organizing. Um, and through that, I found that um, I started adjunct teaching. Um, having, um, being able to say in my bio and on my website that I was a professor, um, gave me a little more clout for people to give me contracts. Um, and when I started adjuncting, I was like, whoa, I love this actually. Um, and it was kind of right time, right place. Um, there was a need for another, um, professor of practice. And so I, it happened. Um, and one thing I really love about that is that um, as a professor of practice, you're still expected to have a practice out in the community and then bring those lessons learned or those connections um, or those real world experiences into the classroom. Um, and that's something that I love. Um, and so it's really, really great to be able to teach and bring in these like real world experiences um, that are, you know, outside of the ivory tower of knowledge, but are actually in community. Um, and so that's kind of how I ended up teaching at the school where I graduated from. Um, if you had asked me when I started at the Brown School, um, if I would end up teaching full time, much less at the Brown School, I never would have imagined that. Um, but it just, it felt right. And I'm really happy to be here and hopefully I'll have some of you in the classroom when you join us. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much, Molly. And I couldn't agree more. I think that it's so incredible that we have so many faculty at the Brown School who have real world experience and can take, bring in that applied knowledge into the classroom. Uh, I'm going to pivot for just a moment because I know Megan has to log off in just a couple moments. Uh, Megan, you are the president of the alumni board. Uh, and so would love to know just like what that experience is like. And for folks who are looking ahead uh, and, and, you know, wanting to stay connected to the Brown School, uh, what that's been like for you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I... I love being on the alumni board. I love finding, so one of the things that I knew and felt really strongly about when I left Brown School after two years is that I wanted to stay connected. I 
I moved to St. Louis not knowing anybody. And I felt like I found such a wonderful community there, both with my peers, other students, but as well as professors and, and other grad students, um, PhD students. And I, I didn't want to lose that connection. Um, I'm lucky uh, being in Chicago, there's still a lot of events that are happening here. Um, Wash U generally, right? Like has these kind of cities where they're doing lots of events. And I loved being connected to WashU, but I wanted to really specifically stay connected to the Brown School. So, um, you know, the the alumni board, we do several things throughout the year. We host um, conversations, both in person and virtual. We do things like book clubs. Um, we can do things like this, right, where we're trying to reach people who are both perspective and folks who are about to leave and want to find ways to stay connected. I think it's it's part of the package, if you will, of when you come to the Brown School, there are several ways that you could stay connected to the community and it really matters. Um, I'm going back in April um, to see some family who happen to live in the area and I'm gonna go see my favorite professor, which is Professor Kirkland, um, right? Like I feel that connection to the school. Um, and I think it's really important to maintain that connection just be not because of the experience that I had while I was there, but because of the enduring experience that I still have, right? I still feel very connected to the school. Some of my best friends are from the school, right? And so it's, it, it is and was important to me to stay connected. And, I, and I'm just honored that I, that I have the opportunity to do so now um, on the alumni board. Incredible. Thank you so much, Megan. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, yes. to log off. Uh, thank you, you all. Contact information. If folks want to reach out to Megan, reach out to Brown Admissions and we can get you connected. Thank you all. Good luck, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I, and I'm paying close attention to time. We're getting very close to the end of our hour, which uh, is incredible. This has been such a great conversation. Thank you all so, so much for your time. I do have one final question to ask everyone before we close things out. And that is, what advice would you give to uh, our admitted and prospective students who are thinking about coming to the Brown School this fall? Uh, we'll start with Ashwarya. Oh gosh, uh, I would say uh, it's tough because I really advocate for my approach to the Brown School, which was to jump in, fully immerse myself and do everything. But that's a really good way to burn out as well. So, you know, just understand your energy levels. And then I would say just ask, ask if you're interested in someone's work, talk to them. You don't have to go into a conversation with an agenda. You can just find people's work interesting and ask, how did you get to this line of work? How is it that you're doing what you're doing? How do I apply for a grant? How do I work in research? Just having really curious conversations is really helpful. Um, I think pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is really helpful as well. I took some random law class and it ended up really helping me out a few years later. When I was working on a project related to international law. Same with I took a class about global anti-poverty interventions and it ended up really informing my work down the line. So take classes that interest you, even if they're not part of your career pathway, if that's something you can afford to do. Um, and I would say that if you can get to know St. Louis as a city and really like commit to understanding the people who live in St. Louis, the organizations who work in St. Louis, it makes the experience of being at the Brown School so fulfilling because I can't be a shell of a human in a city not connecting to the people around me. Um, that in St. Louis, I really felt like a part of the city, like I was a part of Missouri and that I understood what I had my finger on the pulse of local issues. Um, and there was like a mutual benefit for the community, for me, for Brown School, for WashU. Uh, that's it. Elizabeth, you're next. I was going to say something similar um, in terms of taking the classes that you find interesting, um, because I really do feel like, you know, even if it's a class that might be outside of your explicit requirements, I think that that often is what leads to you being able to articulate and figure out what's interesting for you. Um, I had what one of my Brown School professors called shiny object syndrome, which is like, I look at one thing, I'm like, oh, that's so fascinating. Oh, that thing is so fascinating. Um, I still probably have that, but um, I do think taking like a variety of classes is is hugely beneficial. Plus um, able, you're, like you're more able to get to know other professors that you might not know or get to know other students that you might not know as well because they're not in the same class as you. So would highly recommend that. Molly, I'll go to you. 
Um, like we talked about earlier, you have so many choices in what classes you take and what concentration or specialization and around your practicum. Um, and so I would really recommend work smarter, not harder. Double dip where you can. That is not to say plagiarize yourself. No, no, no. Do not turn in the same paper for one class as you do in another. But think about, okay, in one class, I'm working really hard and going really deep on this specific topic. Can I further explore that same topic in another class and approach the topic from a different lens or different perspective? Also think about what class projects you can also use as a practicum project, because then if you're lucky, you can actually turn your coursework into practicum hours. Um, and that's just like, that's just going deep. Don't feel guilty about doing that. That's just like being efficient. Um, so that's one thing I really, really recommend. All right, and Portia, last but not least. Yeah, so I would um, start from like now that you are waiting for um, maybe your admission or getting ready to come make use of the time that you have now. Um, if you have any free time, like go on the Brown School's website, go through the professors, see what they are doing, um, um, what work they are doing, because so all these professors have their research areas. And then spend that time to see, am I interested in this? Am I interested in that? Um, what do I really want to do? when I come and then, you know, you, you can start reaching out to some of them. I mean, they, they are very busy people. Some of them would reply and some of them might not get to your email by the time you get here, but it's still fine. I'm making use of, of that time. And I would finally say that as an international student, the Brown School is the best place for you. I mean, this is from my personal experience. As I said earlier, I've been here like Molly was one of my TAs. I don't know if you remember me. I've been here for five years. Um, for my PhD, I got offers in um, four other places, four other top schools, but I still decided to stay here because of the support that the Brown School gives to international students. I mean, gives to all students, but you know, international students, we have unique uh, um, needs and this is the place for you. There are people to answer your question. There are people that look like you. The Brown School is very diverse in student body and diverse in the faculty. There are faculty from all over the world, from Asia, from Africa, everywhere, from the Middle East. There are people that look like you, people who understand what you are going through as an international student, people who understand, you don't need to explain like, I'm on a student visa, you know, they know how to support you. And even if you, need to talk about something that is not school related, they are here to listen to you. So I would, I would really encourage you if you're an international, I mean, everyone, but especially for international students, the Brown School is a good school for you, for you, the best place where you feel supported. You will not be homesick. I mean, you get all the networks. They, you can also, it will also connect you to professors, schools outside of the Brown School. At my research lab, we collaborate with professors from all over the US, NYU, um, Columbia University, Chicago, and there are also conferences that you would also get to go to when you're working with some of these professors on some or some of these research. So yeah, I don't want to talk too long. The Brown School is a good school. Oh, thank you, Portia. Oh, I appreciate your passion and love that you're still here. Um, well, I know we are uh, at the at the end. And so I just want to quickly share, uh, hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. Yes. Uh, reminder that Admitted Student Weekend is next week. So if you are going to be in St. Louis, we can't wait to see you. Uh, if you aren't able to make it though, we do have some virtual options for you to join us if you're an admitted student. So you can still register and join us virtually. And finally, uh, other ways to connect here is our contact information. Uh, you can always scan the code to get more information from us via email. Uh, but if you'd like to connect with anyone from admissions, um, a current student, or if you'd like to connect with anyone who spoke on this panel today, I know they are all very happy to connect with you and share their experiences. Great. Thank you all so, so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day.
Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Appreciate you.